All right, so we are at 10 minutes past the hour, so we'll get started. Welcome to our second lecture of the day. Uh, my name is Yi, I'm one of the residents at UCSF, and I'm uh, very excited to introduce this morning Dr. David Finley, uh, who's the Director of Robotic Surgery and Assistant Program Director at Kaiser Permanente Los Angeles, and he'll be talking about MRI fusion biopsies today. Great, thanks to Yi, Michelle, uh, Kirsty, the uh, uh, UCSF Collaborative uh, Organizing Committee, which has brought us all together in uh, this unique online forum. Uh, to all the brave and resilient, tenacious individuals listening in New York and surrounding areas, our hearts go out to you and your families. So let's get into this. Uh, we're gonna uh, talk about MRI fusion biopsy, which is one of my favorite topics. It really encompasses all the unique elements uh, and ingredients of why I went into urology technology, imaging, immediate results, which change people's lives. So um, I have no disclosures. Um, I, I really uh, started my interest in this in 2009 when I was a fellow at UCLA, and over the past decade, I've worked uh, with a great team to implement prostate MRI and MRI fusion biopsy across Southern California, Kaiser Permanente. So one footnote, Kara Watts on May 15th is giving a lecture on prostate MRI for a urologist. So today is uh, just sort of an amuse bouche on the MRI portion. Peter Pinto at the NIH is really the godfather of fusion technology leading to the development of Euronav and so much of the evolution of this field, uh, which we owe to his uh, Herculean work. So prostate cancer really can be grouped into two main types. The indolent form, which tends to smolder uh, it uh, is uh, the sort of uh, passenger in the prostate, um, often MRI invisible and, and perfect for active surveillance and avoiding overtreatment. In uh, a JNCI paper from 2013, the, the prevalence of prostate cancer on autopsy of men who died of other causes was evaluated and they prospectively c collected prostates at autopsy in, in Russian and Japanese men. And among uh, uh, them, the prevalence of prostate cancer uh, was 46 uh, and 30, 31% um, in the, the, the group uh, age 60 to 70. And among age uh, 70 to 80, it was about 44%. Gleason 7 or greater was about 30% overall. And, and so um, uh, clinically significant prostate cancer, which, which is really what we're, we're most interested in, you know, have variable definitions, but uh, they're generally uh, have pattern four, 50% uh, core uh, or, or maximum cancer core length, which could range from three to six millimeters. Epstein uses three millimeters. Um, and, and these are really uh, uh, surrogate um, markers uh, that are predictive for the presence uh, of, of lesions that are half a cc or larger. These grow more quickly, they're invasive, they, they uh, need to be uh, treated in most patients. Um, many of them are usually uh, uh, MRI visible and, and, and a bad actor. And so I, I kind of think about this like, like mushrooms, um, you know, many are benign, but you know, a few like uh, Amanita phylloides, the, the death cap and the destroying angel are, are deadly if ingested, uh, leading, to, leading to death. So we know that systematic biopsy is, is hampered by a false negative rate, um, incorrect risk stratification, uh, overdetection uh, of insignificant disease leading to overtreatment, need for repeat biopsy, and it typically misses anterior tumors. So if um, we look at some of the uh, bodies of work that are out there to provide guidance, the uh, AUA and the Society of American uh, Radi uh, Abdominal Radiology uh, issued a joint consensus statement on uh, prostate MRI and, and MRI targeted biopsy. Um, they say when, when prostate MRI is available, it should be considered in any patient with a prior negative biopsy who has suspicion uh, patients with uh, a PIRAD score of three to five warrant repeat biopsy, and you should get at least two, two targeted cores. Um, and so uh, we can also turn to, um, if you go to auanet.org to the guidelines section, you'll find this beautiful document entitled Standard Operating Procedure for MRI of the Prostate. And it really encompasses uh, diagnosis, staging, management of prostate cancer. It's co-authored by an expert uh, AUA panel and SAR panel, panel including my uh, MRI mentor, Dan Margolis. So uh, a few key points from this, um, uh, we can look at the, the, the PROMISE trial, which uh, looks at uh, performance of prostate MRI in men with, with no biopsy, uh, which, which is now supported by, by randomized trials. 
Uh, this is one of those randomized trials. And so let's take a closer look at that. Um, and, and so in, in men presenting for a first prostate biopsy, the potential advantages of MRI and targeted biopsy are twofold. You can improve detection of high-grade cancer, avoid detection of low-grade disease by selective targeting uh, the, the foci that you deem to be uh, more significant. So this was really designed to look at the proportion of men who could safely avoid biopsy using MRI as a, as a triage test. And they had a, a blinded evaluation uh, of MRI and, and trust biopsy um, uh, uh, against a reference test, which was a template uh, prostate mapping biopsy. So this was not a study where they actually did fusion biopsy. They, they were simply looking at trust biopsy, standard trust biopsy against a template where you're, where you're getting cores every five millimeters as the reference test or the gold standard and looking at uh, uh, how MRI uh, would have changed management. So they looked at 740 men uh, who were biopsy naive, but with clinical suspicion. They used a 1.5 uh, Tesla MRI without an endorectal coil. They used a Likert scale similar to Pyrads where they deemed anything three or higher as suspicious. Patients and MDs were blinded. Uh, they, they did the uh, template mapping biopsies with cores every five millimeters, followed by trust biopsy. Uh, uh, they, again, weren't testing MRI targeted versus trust, but the, the mapping, the gold standard, basically picked up 71% of cancers um, uh, and 40% were clinically significant. MRI was found to have a 93% sensitivity versus 48% of trust biopsy, 89% negative predictive value for clinically significant prostate cancer. And uh, the take home point was 27% of patients would avoid biopsy uh, using MRI a, as a triage test. And, and that of course leads to um, uh, reduction in diagnosis of insignificant cancer uh, where you're boosting clinically significant diagnosis. The, uh, precision trial uh, was another uh, big time uh, multi-center randomized uh, trial. This was a non-inferiority trial assigning men with clinical suspicion of prostate cancer uh, who had uh, not undergone biopsy previously to undergo a multiparametric MRI with or without targeted biopsy uh, or standard trust biopsy. So men with low suspicion lesions, PIRADS 1 and 2s, uh, did not undergo biopsy. Uh, in the uh, MRI targeted group, 28% um, had results that were not suggestive of prostate cancer, so they were uh, uh, spared from undergoing biopsy, similar to what was found in the PROMISE trial. Uh, clinically significant cancer was defined as Gleason 3 plus 4. That was detected in 38% of men in the MRI targeted group as compared with 26% in the standard biopsy group, and that was statistically significant. So MRI as a risk assessment tool prior to initial biopsy uh, and MRI targeted biopsy were found not only to be uh, non-inferior, but they were superior to, to standard trust biopsy for the detection of clinically significant cancer. Uh, and fewer men undergoing targeted biopsy uh, had indolent cancers. So as a result of these uh, two studies, the UK National Institute of uh, Health and Care and Excellence recommends prostate MRI as a first line investigation in men with suspected clinically uh, localized prostate cancer. Now, um, there have been um, systematic uh, reviews, meta-analyses of uh, MRI target versus systematic biopsy. And if you look at the force plots, um, they strongly favor uh, the detection of clinically significant prostate cancer with targeted biopsy and uh, systematic biopsy finds more insignificant cancer, a theme that we've talked about a couple times. Uh, there's eight randomized uh, uh, clinical trials that, that have basically supported this. Um, Peter Pinto uh, recently, uh, I'm sure you all saw in New England Journal, um, you know, uh, came out with uh, uh, this <coughs> uh, really powerful um, uh, trial, uh, which um, looked at uh, men with MRI visible uh, lesions and uh, they went under both, underwent both MRI target and systematic biopsy. The primary outcome was cancer detection according to grade, and you know, some men underwent subsequent prostatectomy, and uh, upgrading or downgrading could be assessed, so that was the reference or the gold standard. So 2,100 men underwent uh, both biopsy methods. Cancer was detected in 62% by combined methods. 19% underwent radical prostatectomy. MRI targeted biopsy uh, detected significantly less group one and significantly more uh, group three to five. And so combined biopsy uh, led to cancer diagnosis in 10% more men than either method alone and to upgrading to a higher grade group in 22%. 
So if only MRI-targeted biopsy had been done, 9% of clinically significant cancers would have been misclassified. And, uh, and so in the uh, prostatectomy cohort as well, uh, we, we also saw that uh, there, there were fewer upgrades. So um, this really, I think, is the, is the new gold standard where we're really looking at targeted biopsy uh, plus uh, systematics. So let's talk about some MRI basics. Uh, multiparametric MRI really combines anatomic sequences, T2 weighted imaging with functional sequences, uh, DWI and, and DCE or diffusion weighted imaging and dynamic contrast enhancement. This can be done uh, with 1.5 Tesla or three Tesla with or without a coil. Uh, uh, Endorectal coil acts as an antenna It improves signal to noise ratio. A little bit uncomfortable for, pa for patients, slows down throughput, but certainly can give you a crisper and, and prettier picture. Uh, in 2017, if, if we look kind of around the country, uh, you know, 1.5 Tesla magnets accounted for 70% 70, 70 of the market share and three Tesla uh, accounted for roughly 20%. 20, 20 so uh, we all talk about three Tesla uh, with an endorectal coil. That's kind of the Bugatti, if you will, but a 1.5 Tesla without a coil on a more modern scanner uh, can provide uh, uh, very, very adequate results. So we try to do MRI uh, in, in the uh, patient who is not uh, suspected to have um, ultra high risk disease six to eight weeks after biopsy. That's when clearance of blood products on T1 occurs. And it's really the, the citrate, uh, the high citrate levels uh, in the prostate that kind of preserve uh, the, the, the blood products and, and really causes uh, that, that blood to hang around for a couple months. And, and so we really want to see that clear. We ask patients to empty the rectum, try not to ejaculate for uh, at least three days so that their SVs are plump. Some places give glucagon to, to minimize rectal peristalsis. I like to give patients a Valium uh, if they seem uh, a little bit nervous. Uh, an enema uh, the night before the morning of. Uh, certainly, if they have a hip replacement, we favor 1.5 Tesla, you get less noise. And uh, again, we talked about the coil, but on, on newer, uh, more modern scanners, if you have a 1.5 Tesla with a high number of surface coil elements and, and channels, you can, you can really get a great study. And certainly, a great, great radiologist equals great results. And so when we talk about diffusion weighted imaging, B values, uh, apparent, apparent diffusion coefficients or ADCs, uh, the, the B value is a factor that reflects the strength and timing of the gradients used to generate diffusion weighted imaging. The, the, the higher the B value, the stronger the diffusion, which helps us differentiate between uh, cancerous and non-cancerous tissue. ADC or apparent diffusion coefficient really is the slope of the rate of change of DWI to a B value and that can kind of uh, be universally apply, applied across scanners uh, at, at different centers. Uh, MRI predicts more aggressive disease and so when you look at uh, Gleason uh, 3 and 4 and 5, you, you, you're increasing cellularity. The Gleason grade 3s or group 1s, you can, you can draw a line mentally around each of the glands. Grade, grade 4s, you start to get crib reforming, and uh, grade 5, you get these sheets of necrotic cells. And so you can imagine diffusion of water uh, uh, through, through grade 3 can go right, right, right through there, whereas you know, grade 4, it's uh, a little bit slower, and grade 5, uh, there's, there's a, a significant restriction in diffusion. And so if you look at uh, the ADC value as a function of Gleason score, you see an inverse uh, relationship. And so uh, if we just kind of um, provide some ballpark numbers, you know, if you measure ADC values, uh, on, on your uh, ADC map, you'll, you'll see normal tissue runs ar around 1,500. Uh, Low-grade cancers often run in the 1,000 range, intermediate around 800, and high-grade 600 or less. When you uh, opt to get an MRI early, uh, let's say just a, a week or two after biopsy in somebody who you suspect high-grade disease, uh, you, you really uh, expect to see a lot of hemorrhage on T1 in, in the upper left here. And you can look for kind of the hemorrhage exclusion sign, which uh, is thought to occur because tumor bleeds a little less than normal tissue. So in areas of less hemorrhage, look for cancer there, and, and that often can, can lead you to where the tumor is. So the, the prostate imaging reporting and data system has undergone uh, several iterations. Uh, each lesion is assigned a score from one to five, indicating the likelihood of clinically significant cancer. And it's reported on a 41 sector map uh, really, most uh, radiologists uh, who, who do this a lot are, are recording, uh, reporting this as 
uh, peripheral zone, transition zone, the clock phase is at, at four o'clock, at seven o'clock, and is at 30, 50, 90% of the apex uh, uh, base distance. And so uh, like the Likert scale that, that we talked about um, earlier, the, the pyrads ones and twos are, are very low to low probability where, where clinically significant prostate cancer is highly unlikely and unlikely. Uh, pyrads three is equivocal. Um, you know, we see a lot of pyrads threes and, and that uh, translates in the literature, you know, anywhere between uh, 20 and 35 percent of those are, are, are clinically significant prostate cancer. Pyrads fours and fives are, are both um, uh, basically highly likely to be prostate cancer measuring less than 1.5 cm's or greater than 1.5 cm's. So when we look at prostate anatomy on MRI, we think about the peripheral zone, which is what you can feel on digital rectal exam. Here's the rectum at the bottom, the transition zone where BPH occurs, and then the anterior fibromuscular stroma. If we look at the most uh, re recent iteration of, of PIRADS, uh, they have kind of simplified things. This looks kind of busy, but basically, uh, if you're looking at a peripheral zone lesion, you're going to favor diffusion weighted imaging. That's driving the scoring, whereas on the right, the transition zone lesions, the T2, uh, drives the score. And so really in the peripheral zone, uh, any, anything, um, you know, in the PZ that, that has, um, you know, low ADC values, uh, you know, that's T2 hypo intense, uh, I'm pretty much going to go after uh, in the TZ because there's a lot of BPH and a lot of uh, inherent heterogeneity. You're really looking for uh, kind of a smudgy T2 image. Uh, you know, the, they tend to have a, 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 a lower ADC value as well, but it's really that, that sort of smudgy T2 appearance where, where you've got uh, obscured margins. And so you can uh, check out the, the PIRADS document and, and look at examples uh, in, in the peripheral zone here on the left of PIRADS 1, one through 5s. Uh, in, in PIRADS 3s, you're starting to see this uh, non-circumscribed uh, or, or you know, moderately hypo-intense T2 lesion. Uh, PIRADS 4s and 5s are starting to look uh, nastier and bigger. And then in the transition zone, again, uh, you're, you're looking for uh, these sort of um, nodules that, that uh, do not look like BPH. And uh, uh, diffusion-weighted imaging, uh, very important for uh, uh, um, the uh, peripheral zone lesions, whereas uh, in T2, we're relying more on the, on the uh, uh, excuse me, for the transition zone, we're relying a little bit more on T2. So contrast enhancement really has become uh, uh, more simple. When, when I started, we were measuring kinetic parameters, K-trans, K-EP, uh, but, but now we're really looking at uh, kind of a binary. It's either negative where there's no early enhancement, uh, it, it's uh, correlating you know, with, with BPH nodules, or it's positive where you have focal earlier enhancement, uh, which also corresponds to findings that are suspicious on T2 or DWI. So let's talk about fusion biopsy uh, techniques now that we, we got the uh, hors d'oeuvres out of the way. And so really this uh, uh, can, can be done in a variety of different methods and, and uh, inbore is, you know, uh, with, with Yelly Barents in, in uh, the Netherlands or uh, Steve Raymond and, and Dave Liu at UCLA, you know, that is, if you have access to that, uh, fantastic. Uh, Euronav and Artemis are really the two dominant systems that we see. Uh, across the United States. Uh, there are some other uh, minor systems, and then there are still some doing cognitive fusion, and, and these can be done by transrectal or transperineal routes. So uh, I'm gonna focus mostly on, on Euronav, which is uh, the, the, the technology that we uh, have uh, uh, launched in, in our system. And uh, in uh, 2016, I, I you know, ran a trial head-to-head -head, uh, Artemis versus uh, Euronav, and I really love both systems, and, and just for, for our uh, uh, healthcare system, Euronav uh, made a little bit more sense, but, but anybody who has Artemis knows what a wonderful machine that is. Uh, Inbore biopsy, a um, little bit complicated, a little bit time-consuming, expensive, but uh, can, can be done in, in select patients. Um, I, I usually reserve that for, for patients who don't have an anus. So uh, Dynacad is the software that, that uh, Euronav uses where uh, a GU radiologist or, or the urologist uh, uh, who's good at reading MRI uh, processes, post-processes the MRI study. It really takes three to four minutes for a case. It has a very user-friendly interface. It enables you to modify an existing plan if you see other lesions, maybe that the radiologist didn't see. 
Um, it avoids last minute cancellations if you have this capability. And uh, it's really mandatory if you're doing fusion biopsy in the OR uh, because you need to put the studies onto a thumb drive and, and since uh, the, the external company uh, that, that brings in uh, the device, if you don't own your, your own, uh, can't access the server. Uh, volumetrics are, are easily done according to the ellipsoid formula. Um, this is what the Dynacad uh, screen looks like, and you can customize your, your own dashboard. And so when, uh, uh, here's a recent patient that, that I had, uh, you, you can very quickly uh, uh, segment um, the, the, the lesion, the ROI, um, you can see uh, uh, this is sort of at the border of the, the PZ and the TZ, and you'll uh, uh, segment the gland, create, create an outline of the gland, which you can fine tune to the patient's specific prostate anatomy. Uh, you're going to export the T2 uh, and then the two Dynacad studies. So there's three files that are sent to the server, and uh, then you're able to download that the morning of the study on, on Euronab. So, for, for Euronav, uh, you know, I am um, uh, going to focus on that, as I said, but Artemis is very similar. So we'll, we'll do a rectal swab uh, to assess for quinolone resistant within six weeks of biopsy. A uh, patient will do an enema the evening before the morning of. I, I personally give them three days of culture-specific antibiotics. Uh, if um, uh, they're susceptible to Cipro, for example, they'll get Cipro uh, day before, day of, day after. I use uh, augmented antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, usually with 500 milligrams of IM amikacin. Even if they're on uh, the right antibiotic, if they're not cipro resistant, it's you know difficult, as, as we know, to, for antibiotics to penetrate the prostate. And so uh, the 500 of, of amikacin lingers for about 24 hours and really covers most patients. If they're resistant to, uh, let's say, uh, both cipro and Bactrim, uh, which uh, we, we see that not infrequently, I'll give them doxy or vantin uh, with uh, amikacin ceftriaxone two hours prior to allow uh, uh, prostate penetration. With that, uh, unpublished, but I've, I've had a sepsis rate of about 0.1% in about 3,000 biopsies. Uh, no electronics should be in the room that uh, interferes with the near field generator. Uh, I use the BK3000 with a, a, a triplane probe, an 18 gauge, 20 centimeter Bardmax core gun. Uh, the near field generator um, or, or the, this backpack is, is uh, positioned over the hip of the patient. I put a Eurojet, um, use betadine uh, to clean uh, the anus and inside the rectum, and then I'll use my finger as a shoehorn to gently insert the probe after I've dilated the anus. And when you do that on sagittal, you can uh, follow the curve of the rectum and uh, it's uh, much more comfortable than just sh uh, shoving it in there. So I'll use 20 cc's of quarter percent plain marcaine and 1% lidocaine plain mixed, uh, 5 cc's on uh, each bundle and, and near the SV, 10 cc's at the apex. And you really want to avoid the, the veins uh, that you'll see uh, on, on the lateral aspect of the prostate because you can actually get uh, tonic-clonic seizures, uh, hearing loss uh, if you inject straight in, into the vein. Um, you'll adjust the probe depth uh, between 6 and 10 megahertz. 6 is sort of the baseline, but if you have a big prostate, you're going to want to bring that down to about 10 megahertz. Um, you'll do a sweep, and uh, this is either a pullback or a roll. I use a foot pedal, and then you'll go through uh, the software. When we biopsy, I take three cores for large targets, up to five cores for, for tiny targets, and we'll separate um, these uh, uh, into uh, MRI targeted versus uh, systematic uh, containers. And I would say, you know, at first it might take you 45 minutes. After a while, it'll take you 15 minutes. And um, after you do a lot of them, it's about six to eight minutes, uh, depending on how many uh, targets you're doing. So I prefer to biopsy in sagittal with a, a side fire with the patient in left lateral decubitus. And so, you know, that to me is intuitive. Uh, if, if you, you know, are, are pointing to the patient's left shoulder, you're at the left base. If you point to the right shoulder, you're at the right base. If you point towards uh, the, uh, the left penis, you're, you're at the, the, the left apex and so forth. Um, and it, just, you know, moving the prostate uh, uh, probe from side to side, you're basically going from bundle to bundle. So again, radial devi deviation, you know, uh, left base, ulnar deviation uh, uh, to the apex, simple intuitive move, whereas flexion and extension of the probe, um, you're, you're going from, from bundle to bundle. So let's look at a, a procedure, and, and this really is uh, kind of the total length of, of the procedure. I, I've done um, the, the block already on the patient, and uh, you know that takes about 30 seconds. And so once, once the block is done, 
we're going to go ahead and do a sweep where we're capturing in, uh, about 100 images. You're going to assess the quality of the sweep, and if there's no large black wedges out there, then it's a good sweep. You're going to put it, place fiducials around the prostate. <clears throat> you can place just uh, you know four uh, at the base apex, left, right, anterior, posterior, uh, placing more of those um, on some of the older systems. You may get a better uh, segmentation. And so once you uh, place your fiducials, you're going to segment the gland. And so I like to scroll in sagittal all the way to the edge, and I'm going to start adjusting by snapping this out and bringing it in, uh, this green line, to follow the contour of, of the prostate. And you can see it's a beautiful uh, image on uh, a BK3000 or 5000, which has a gaming processor in, inside. And so once I'm happy on sagittal, I'll move over to the axial image. And uh, if you've done a good job on the first one, you're not going to have too much to do. I'll smooth that. And now we're going to do uh, the fusion. And so here you're going to almost always make a uh, counterclockwise rotation. We're going to, uh, uh, let's just pause this for one second, bring uh, the, the green, which is the ultrasound, against the, the purple, which is the MRI. And so you're trying to do a best fit here and just trying to uh, uh, split the difference and get the two to, to line up as, as closely as you can. You can, um, you know, use the blend function here to drag it back and forth to look at the bladder as a reference to just make sure that you're, you're lining up uh, nicely. So once you've done that, you can com compute elastic deformation. Um, that's going to make uh, you know the the registration uh, look nicer to you. And, and there's been studies. Peter Pinto has has looked at um, novice versus expert with and without elastic deformation. I, I recommend that most people just leave it on. Um, you know, a, a tip is you can look at the region of interest, and if you apply the the elastic deformation. If there isn't really much of a change in the location of that, it probably doesn't, doesn't matter. But I think just leaving it on certainly for, for beginners is the way to go. So once you've done that, you're going to do um, uh, uh, what's called uh, interprocedure alignment. And so um, we're going to just bring the uh, MRI outline, which uh, is over the ultrasound here, doing interprocedure alignment. We're switching now planes to, to an axial plane. And usually when you switch over, the depth is going to change. And so you want to go back to your same depth. You can see that the outline here is much bigger. And, and so when we go back to 6 megahertz, we'll line that up. And so this is now aligning uh, the MRI essentially in uh, the, the axial plane. Okay. And so now once we have done that uh, interprocedure alignment, we're going to switch back to, to sagittal, which is how I, I prefer to, to do the biopsy. And now... Up top, you can see the, the ultrasound in real time and the MRI in the bottom, and we're, we're ready to go. And uh, uh, when um, you're, you're thinking about biopsying a target, you really want to uh, align, and the, the, the nurse is, is, is uh, adjusting uh, the outline of the MRI against the target, but you really want to uh, focus on the edge that has the target is the one that is most important to align, okay? And so with this good apical block, anterior lesions are no more painful or difficult uh, to access. And so you're going to uh, uh, tell the patient not to move at this point, um, bring the needle up right to the edge. I'm going to look for the olive with the pimento, and I'm going to take a core through that. And so um, that can be marked uh, so that it's memorialized uh, in there. We're going to add that. Uh, the, the nurse is going to do that, and then we're going to go back. So again, here's the olive with the pimento. That's kind of the midline of the target. As you go from one side to the other, you can see uh, this uh, uh, slider here changes from yellow to blue. And so, um, for for this particular target, we're gonna we're gonna take three samples. Okay, and so that's it. My biopsy strategy, which we just talked about, you know, one through the olive and pimento, and then one on, on each side, and, and it, it really depends on the target. For for a pyrads five, three samples is fine. For for a you know a, a four millimeter pyrads four, uh, you you may want to uh, take more cores because you're a little less confident that you'll hit that. Um, and so the the rationale for taking multiple multiple samples, you can kind of um, you know think about tumor heterogeneity, and if you um, fool around with elastography feature on, on the BK, um, you can see that there, there's some heterogeneity, and these are different uh, areas of the tumor. And if you look at whole mount sections and do uh, micro dissection, um, there can be, you know, obviously different uh, uh, grades of tumor within a lesion which have their own uh, genomic profile. And so 
you know, troubleshooting, um, invite your radiologist on a field trip to come see some of your cases, uh, record your cases initially and, and uh, review them, uh, particularly if you get negative pathology, uh, you want to make sure that you didn't miss it. Um, I like to send confirm MDX if you have that available at, at your center, uh, if I'm, I'm highly suspicious but I have a negative biopsy. Certainly uh, have a low threshold to re-biopsy if you, if you suspect you might have missed it. Um, Hands-on courses are great. We've uh, held a couple of those and, and I think that's really important uh, when, when uh, you, you're launching these around uh, your healthcare system. And you should really see a cross centers uh, uh, inter uh, site hit rate should be similar for pyrads threes, fours, and fives. So if you've got an outlier, um, you know, for, for pyrads fives, for example, which is only 60% positive versus, you know, the other sites, which are 85 to 90%, then, um, you know, that, that site needs a refresher course. So biopsy strategies, um, you know, if they've had a recent prior negative biopsy and the MRI is positive, I usually do only targeted cores. Um, in, in, unless uh, a confirm MDX was sent and, and that was positive elsewhere. I, I think about confirm MDX, which is detecting uh, uh, hypermethylation in, in, you know, it's an epigenetic test looking at the DNA of the normal tissue. Uh, so, you know, that can, can sometimes detect MRI invisible tumors, some of which can be clinically significant. And so um, uh, prior ASAP, uh, I'll usually uh, saturate that area or if it's an active surveillance patient, uh, we'll, we'll do uh, MRI targeted. Uh, if they've got a target, usually my active surveillance patients are MRI negative, uh, and then we'll, we'll do systematics on them. Uh, anterior prostate cancer really deserves its own slide. Uh, the, these are tumors that lie above the equator, uh, you know, which is based on, on the urethra. And uh, those are frequently seen among prior biopsy negative patients who uh, are MRI positive. And, and if we think back to that autopsy study that we talked about at the beginning, 20% of cancers were in the anterior prostate. Um, anterior apical biopsy really should be routinely part of a systematic uh, template. Uh, so instead of a 12-core template, uh, consider a 14-core template where you're taking samples from the anterior apex. That obviously is not gonna sample uh, the majority of the, the anterior prostate, but it will pick up uh, some of those apical ones. Um, and we've seen um, uh, that uh, confirm MDX, you know, has uh, uh, missed tumors uh, where, where they're in the anterior. So that's kind of garbage in, gar garbage out. If you, if you don't sample the field, you can't pick up the, the field defect. So how does active surveillance change or really improve with uh, MRI fusion biopsy in your arsenal? So at, at, at my center, in my practice, uh, I, I will perform uh, a systematic biopsy, or let's say the patient has had a systematic biopsy, uh, and uh, I put an asterisk there because there are certainly some patients who are getting upfront biopsies who are, who are um, uh, uh, excuse me, upfront MRIs who are biopsy naive, but um, if they fall into the low risk group, uh, let's say one quarter least and six on their initial systematic, then uh, they will get uh, an MRI. Um, let's say uh, they are intermediate or, or high risk on that initial systematic biopsy. Um, they're going to be excluded from, our, from uh, surveillance, but they're also going to get an MRI for, for staging. So if the MRI is uh, non-focal, if, if, if we don't see anything, then uh, the uh, patient is going to get a systematic confirmatory biopsy. Uh, that is uh, obviously an evolution, you know, whether or not confirmatory biopsy is needed in, in patients who have uh, uh, an initial um, uh, biopsy showing low-risk prostate cancer and a, and a negative MRI, if it's a high-quality MRI. Um, alternatively, if the MRI shows a prior ADS3 or higher lesion, they're, they're going to get a, a fusion confirmatory biopsy, uh, or they just may go on to treatment, let's say, uh, you know, this patient has a pyrads 5 in the anterior prostate. You know, there, there are many patients, you don't actually need to biopsy that to confirm it. You, know, you would just go straight to treatment if it's highly suspicious. Um, and so low-risk patients, uh, for, for me, are getting a PSA uh, every four to six months. They're getting an annual uh, digital rectal exam, and then they're getting an MRI and a biopsy every three years. We tailor that, obviously, to the individual. If it's a 41-year-old, uh, with three cores, who, who's very uh, borderline for, for MRI, we, uh, for active surveillance rather, we might do him uh, every 18 months. Uh, if, if it's a 74-year-old with one core 5%, then he might be every, every three to four years. New nomograms have been uh, uh, developed, and, and so many of us are used to using the MSK nomograms, and so it's great to have 
uh, some newer nomograms which are looking at inclusion of targeted biopsy. Uh, the uh, Briganti nomogram has been upgraded, which uh, uh, is now looking at clinical stage based on MRI and, and grade group based on MRI targeted biopsy as well as the maximum uh, diameter of the, the index lesion. And this, um, you know, if you look at uh, ROC curves, increases the AUC significantly uh, up to 86%, uh, which is where we like to see it. And so for this particular nomogram, if you're, if you're looking at it for lymph node dissection, um, you know, it, it really boosts the, uh, the, the power of that. So, you know, better, better imaging and, and better software, better hardware means better targeting and, and therefore increased utilization of, of, of focal therapy. And so, you know, at our center, we've started doing a few MRI-guided primary focal cryotherapy cases, which uh, are, are uh, pretty cool. You know, uh, as your confidence in, in being able to ablate a lesion goes up, um, you're, you're going to be more enthusiastic about uh, offering uh, primary focal therapy for appropriate uh, cases. And you're going to be able to uh, uh, tighten the isotherm on that so that you're, you're getting more targeted and less collateral damage. Uh, interesting um, side note, you can also sample some non-prostate targets that are out of reach of uh, interventional radiology, which could include lymph nodes or extra luminal rectal cancers. And so here's a, a, a case that uh, we, su we submitted a case report for recently where uh, there uh, was a large rectal cancer here, which was outside the, the rectal lumen. Um, and so uh, marking the uh, tumor as the ROI with kind of the prostate as, as the reference, we were able to uh, sample that and, and uh, uh, prove that he had uh, rectal cancer uh, outside the rectum. And so patient selection, you know, we talk about shared decision making. Um, you know, certainly you have to look at your standard uh, uh, clinical parameters, elevated PSA velocity, high PSA density, low free PSAs. Uh, abnormal uh, PHI or 4K testing if you're utilizing those. Um, any uh, PIRADS 4 or 5 really uh, is going to undergo biopsy. PIRADS 3s, uh, you have to be thoughtful about. <clears throat> you know, most of those in the peripheral zone, um, I'll, I'll go after, you know, if, if their PSA is, is abnormal uh, or PSA kinetics are abnormal. For uh, transition zones, I really don't go after many PIRADS 3s uh, in, unless they have a disproportionately low ADC value. Uh, BPH nodules usually don't restrict diffusion uh, as much as the tumors, and, and certainly the uh, pyrads 3s and the TZ that have that smudgy or erased charcoal appearance will we'll go after. Um, use ancillary tests thoughtfully, like Confirm MDX, which, which is an expensive test. Um, and, um, you know, I just put this in because it's kind of a pet peeve. You'll, you'll, you'll get referrals for these bulky pyrads 5s where um, they're referred for, for fusion biopsy when, when a systematic biopsy, um, you know, is going to pick this up 99% uh, of the time. And so don't, don't wait if there uh, is, a, is a backlog to get fusion biopsy done. Uh, the referring urologists uh, should, should really just do a standard biopsy because they'll, they'll, they'll hit these every time. And so um, if uh, all of you could, um, you know, share your, your, your thoughts uh, about the survey, it's been a real privilege and, and pleasure. And I, I know we uh, flew through some of that, um, but uh, I really wanted to focus, you know, kind of on, on the, the technical aspects of it a, a little bit more. And um, you'll, and, uh, again, on May 15th, get a lecture on prostate MRI. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Dr. Finley, for an awesome talk, a very detailed um and comprehensive. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, if both your low and non-low risk patients are getting an MRI post biopsy, have you gotten an MRI pre-biopsy to avoid having to repeat a confirmatory fusion or to avoid biopsy altogether if MRI is negative? Yeah, and so, you know, it's uh, e evolving and, and it, it, you know, it really depends on the cost uh, of, of the MRI at your center. Uh, you know, MRI can, can range from uh, $500 to, to $2,000. It depends on, on the coverage of the patient. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, it, uh, there are certainly the, the uh, JPL, the engineers, the physicist patients who are going to come in with all, all of their PSAs uh, mapped out on an Excel spreadsheet, and um, you know many of them are going to get MRIs up, up front, and, and you know I uh, in, in my practice will 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 get that on you know I would say a vast majority of patients, and, and I think there are, are several randomized trials to to support that. 
Um, and, and in many of them, uh, if their MRI is, is, uh, is non-focal, then, then we'll avoid a confirmatory biopsy. Um, having said that, you know, uh, you have to be just very careful and, and let patients know that if, if their MRI is, is negative, if it's non-focal, um, you know, they really still need a biopsy because, uh, you know, MRI is picking up the larger, the more significant cancers. Um, you can find, um, you know, Gleason 7s, 8s, 9s that, that are neophytic that the MRI can't see. Certainly, if you have a, a 3D Tesla with a coil, you're going to pick up more of those. But uh, a negative MRI does not get you out of a biopsy if your PSA kinetics are abnormal. Um, there are some ancillary tests now like Select MDX, which is a urine test replacing PCA3. Uh, that's a, you know, being marketed as a liquid biopsy. And so, uh, again, you know, some of those patients are getting that. So if you've got a non-focal MRI and, and a, a low probability Select MDX, then you know, it might be reasonable to monitor that patient. Great. A um, couple more questions here that are just coming in. Uh, so a question about more technical details. Can you elaborate more on the B value? How does it better help, uh, help better quality images? So, you know, typically your uh, radiologist is, is going to run, um, you know, varying B values um, ranging from, from 400 to, to 1400. Uh, and um, you, you're going to, um, you know, sort of uh, apply um, uh, uh, these different B values, which are creating different gradients to, to create um, a, a better ADC map. And so, you're, you know, I, I don't really look at the, the 400, the 800, the 1400 uh, B value DWI images. I, I pretty much will go to the ADC map, but, um, uh, you know, that uh, it is probably um, uh, something that your, your radiology lecture will focus a little bit more on the physics of that. But essentially, um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at diffusion of water under different magnetic gradients, which helps uh, differentiate the benign from the malignant tissue. So um, I'll, I'll skip straight to, uh, to my ADC map, but I will have the DWI, um, uh, usually with the highest B value next to it, just to make sure that you're seeing restricted diffusion as well as a low ADC value. Great. Um, I think you mentioned for higher resolution MRIs that without an endorectal coil can be just as good. Do you have your patients use an endorectal coil? And if they don't because of discomfort, how big of an impact does that make to not have that? Yeah. So when I was at UCLA, everybody got a three Tesla with a coil. And so, you know, I was, I was spoiled uh, because you're really getting um, a beautiful picture. Um, you know, certainly the uh, uh, coil, um, which is a balloon that you inflate in the rectum, is uncomfortable for patients. It does slow down throughput, uh, and it adds cost. Uh, coil's about fifty thousand um, dollars, and so um, with with modern scanners like like we have, if you're using a cardiac uh, coil or or you have a lot of um, you know channels. Uh, the, the coil is, is, is really not needed. And so I, I kind of think of it as like an iPhone C, um, you know, or, or um, you know, t t to me, if I had the 3T with a coil, I would, I would use it for many patients. But since uh, I don't, we, we have a three Tesla coming, but we do have very modern 1.5 Teslas. And so, um, you know, we get great pictures. And, and I think, um, you know, it's what the majority of the country uh, is, is still using. Um, at academic centers, certainly the, the vast majority are, are three Tesla. And so the um, uh, other uh, point is, um, uh, you know, um, uh, escaping me. I, I, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, I apologize. But um, yeah, I think um, 1.5T, a lot of discussion, a lot of debate. Um, uh, oh, the, the point I was going to make is that, you know, with a 1.5T, you know, it's sort of this lower fidelity version. You, you could make the argument, I think, that you're going to pick up the more significant cancers. Um, and, and some of my, uh, you know, radiology colleagues who've been doing this for a decade, um, they say, yeah, with the three Tesla, you know, in a coil, I, I get a prettier picture, but, you know, I can still see the lesion on what we're working with. And so does the prettier picture really add much? Um, you know, uh, maybe, maybe not. It's sort of, you know, the Porsche versus Bugatti. They're both, uh, you know, fun cars to drive, I would imagine. Great. A uh, question about if you can talk more specifically about your biopsy technique. Do you only rotate the probe or angulate it? And can you discuss the concept of side fire versus end fire for the more junior residents? Yeah. Um, so 
um, part of this depends on you know how uh, how you were trained um, and and what your you know what your machine is and so um, you know I, I used to use a Hitachi with with a bi you know biplaner and I would have both the 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 axial and, and the sag up um, and so um, you know I, I really have gotten used to um, you know just uh, looking at uh, side fire with 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 sagittal images and so you know if you look at the the needle guide here. Um, your your end fire, which is blue, you know, is, is just firing straight from the tip, whereas the side fire is this sh uh, shorter channel is, is 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 firing from the side. And so, um, when uh, I do a sweep, um, you know, first the you know a pullback in, in axial from base to apex is really the easiest way to do a sweep. Um, but due to gluteal corpulence, patient anatomy. Um, you know, to get all the way to the SVs um, in, in that uh, uh, plane is, is a little difficult. You're really kind of ramming the probe in there. And so um, I prefer just a, a, a sagittal sweep. It's just rotating my, my wrist from, from left to right. Um, and uh, to, to me, the, the movements are, are, are very intuitive. And so uh, I'll do 99% of my biopsies, you know, in, in sag with, with side fire. And, you know, if there's a lesion that I can't get to for whatever reason, um, you know, then I, I will go through uh, and fire uh, through through the uh, the blue um, uh, sheath there, needle guide there. I don't know if that answers that that question. Great. Uh, there's a clarification question. Uh, this question asks: Did you mention previously that there were patients you take for treatment without a tissue diagnosis, or in some cases, or are you talking about that not all men require fusion biopsy? In particular? Uh, so I, I was saying uh, a, a couple points. One is if uh, if you're talking about your active surveillance pathway, um, patients who have low risk disease, who then get MRI, who have a, a PIRADS 3, 4, or 5, you know, usually the threes I'm going to biopsy, um, but if, it, if it's a larger, uh, nastier four or five, you know, some of those patients, you don't need to do a fusion biopsy. They can just go to treatment, right? So if this guy's got, you know, um, uh, focal extracapsular extension, I don't need to do a fusion biopsy to, to, to prove that. We can just say, hey, let's, let's treat you, right? Um, and uh, some, some patients who, let's say, have... Um, bulky uh, digital rectal exam, their T3 on rectal exam with, with a PSA of 100 and, and their MRI shows, you know, T3A plus B disease, um, you know, in, in that patient, I, I may treat them uh, with, with hormone therapy and send them to radiation without a tissue diagnosis. That's pretty rare, but those are the guys that have, you know, uh, extremely obvious bulky disease where uh, really the biopsy is not going to change my management. So I'm, I, I would never uh, do a prostatectomy on somebody with, without uh, a tissue diagnosis. Are there patients that if they are low enough risk when they come, say PSA is just above four, have, have uh, a benign sort of select MDX and a benign MRI that you would not biopsy and just wait on the initial biopsy? Um, so patients who are trying to get out of biopsy, who, whose other tests look favorable, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the question, Yi, but yeah. um, I, I will, um, you know, almost always uh, tell a patient they should still have a biopsy um, if, um, you know, if their free PSA is low, let's say their PSA is in the 4 to 10 range, um, or their uh, 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 PSA density, which, you know, you're, you're going to get uh, a, a very great volumetric assessment of the prostate on, on MRI. And so, you know, if their PSA density is 0.15 or higher, you know, I, I strongly recommend to those patients that we, that we still do a biopsy because we pick up uh, cancer in a significant proportion of them that, you know, and, and certainly if you've got a three Tesla, then, you, you know, you might change that threshold a little bit. Great. Can you just talk a, briefly about sort of how you approach patients? I think you mentioned this briefly, but how you approach patients who've had an APR, don't have an anal canal, and how, how do you biopsy those patients? Uh, I send them for in-gantry biopsy, um, in-bore in MRI-targeted biopsy. Okay, great. I think that's all the questions we have. Um, so thank you so much again for your talk and your time and for joining us. And for all the viewers, if you could please fill out the evaluations for us so we can keep trying to improve the series. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Finley. Thank you so much, guys. Stay safe.